welcome to Redeemer Evangelical Lutheran Church, God's house, your home. Welcome home on this seventh and last Sunday of Easter. Our focus for this Sunday is waiting. This seventh Sunday of Easter is the Sunday after our Lord's ascension and the Sunday before Pentecost. When the Lord ascended, the disciples were waiting for the Holy Spirit to come on Pentecost. Disciples, and so are we, waiting for Jesus to come again. And we are waiting to meet our Father in heaven once again, when on our last days we go to be with Him. And so today, we focus on waiting for what is better and what is best. Let us begin our service with the singing of our first hymn, Sing of our first hymn, Draw Us to Thee, hymn 170. Upon this, your confession, 
I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior, was taken up in glory and intercedes for us at your right hand. Through your living and abiding word, give us hearts to know him and faith to follow where he has gone, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson, which will also serve as our sermon text for today, is from 1 Samuel chapter 1. When this man, Elkanah, and his entire household went up to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go up with them, because she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will bring him so that he can appear before the Lord and remain there permanently. Her husband Elkanah said to her, Do whatever you think is best. Wait until you have weaned him. Yes, then the Lord will establish his word. So the woman stayed at home and she nursed her son until she was ready to wean him. When she had weaned him, she took him up with her. She also took a three-year-old bowl 25 pounds of flour and a container of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. The boy was with them, and they brought him before the Lord, and his father killed the sacrifice as he regularly did before the Lord, and he brought the boy. When they had killed the bull, they presented the child to Eli. She said, Excuse me, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here next to you, praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I have asked for. So now I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord. So he worshipped the Lord there. This is the word of our Lord. We we'll continue with the song of the day, Psalm 8. I will praise your name forever, my King and my God. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth! You have set your glory above the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, what is man that you are mindful of him, the Son of Man, that you care for him. I will praise your name forever, my King and my God. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will praise your name forever, my King and my God. Our second lesson is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Since we have that same spirit of faith, which corresponds to that what is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. We also believe, and therefore we speak. For we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and bring us together with you into his presence. In fact, all this is for your benefit, so that as grace increases, it will overflow to the glory of God, as more and more people give thanks. Therefore, we are not discouraged, but even if our outer self is wasting away, yet our inner self is being renewed day by day. Yes, our momentary light 
trouble produces for us an eternal weight of glory that is far beyond any comparison. We are not focusing on what is seen or what is not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. This is the word of our Lord. The verse for the day is from John 14, verse 23. Alleluia, alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you, alleluia. Our gospel for the day from John chapter 17. After Jesus had spoken these things, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, so that your Son may glorify you. For you gave him authority over all flesh, so that he may give eternal life to all those you have given him. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. I have glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me at your own side with the glory I had at your side before the world existed. I revealed your name to the men you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have held on to your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they received them. They learn the truth that I came from you. They believe that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, because they are yours. All that is mine is yours, and what is yours is mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer going to be in the world, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. This is the gospel of our Lord. We continue with the hymn of the day, Jesus, my great high priest. The chosen devotion that is typically between this hymn is posted as a separate video in the, as a link in the description below. We sing, Jesus, my great high priest, hymn 359. A 
us begin our meditation of God's word with a prayer. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleased in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. And to you, my fellow believers, we are still going through the pains, toils, and sorrows of our daily lives here on earth. Grace and peace comfort and confidence, joy, years in abundance as we eagerly wait for, our Lord, for God's glory to be fully revealed for what is best for us. Amen. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for a birthday, a vacation, some sort of get-together? Or maybe it's something else. It seems like we're constantly waiting for something that is better to come up in our lives because quite honestly, our day-to-day -day lives are not that great. They're just filled with pains and other bad things. And so we wait for that event or thing that is better that is coming up. And once that thing or event, that birthday, vacation, or get-together has arrived and has gone, well, there seems to always be another birthday, vacation, get-together, or something else that we're able to look forward to that is oftentimes even better than what just had happened. We wait for what is better in our lives to come and arrive. I'll tell you what, Hannah, she was waiting for what is better in her life. And then she had to wait for what was best in her life. You too, you wait for what is better for your life. But you'll have to wait for what is best, as what is best comes at the end. I'm going to share, if you don't mind, a personal experience of my own with you. The birth of my first child was quite the experience. And I was fortunate enough that since it was my first child, and I was able to work it out with my schedule, and I was able to go to all these doctor appointments with my wife while she was pregnant with our first child. And I looked forward to each of those appointments. There's just so much excitement going into each of those appointments, so much joy as I got to learn each time how our child was forming and was growing. I have to say the most exciting appointments though were, well first of all, the ultrasound ones. There, the love for my unborn child deepened as I got to see a picture of him. And then, probably the most exciting appointments were the last few. There, I got to hear how things were progressing and just waiting and knowing that the birth of my child was close at hand. And after each of these appointments even, my wife and I would go out and we would discuss further what these appointments were and, and all that had happened. But like I said before, there's just so much joy and excitement that went into each of these doctor appointments. And though there was so much joy and excitement at each of these appointments, and it was better than the other days leading up to that, was best by far was the day of my my son's birth. What was best was able to see him arrive into this world. And my love and joy and excitement once I got to see him and hold him, well, there was no comparison between the appointments and that moment that led up to that time of his birth. Sure. 
Those appointments were better than the day-to-day -day lives during that time. But what was best was the day of my son's birth, as also what was best was the day of my daughter's birth, too. Yet, I can't say that I fully understood or, or know, knew what Hannah was going through. First of all, I'm a father and she's a mother. But I also did not go through her situation that led up to the birth of her first child. Hannah, she was barren. She couldn't have children, or at least she wasn't having children. And that was a tough enough situation for any husband and wife to go through, but what made that situation even tougher was that there was a rival wife. And she could have plenty of children. And this other wife, Penina, she wasn't gracious about this with Hannah. In fact, she taunted Hannah that she couldn't have children. The Bible tells us Hannah's rival kept taunting her to make her miserable because the Lord had kept Hannah from having children. Year after year, when Hannah went up to the Lord's house, her rival taunted her. So Hannah would weep and would not eat. Hannah had enough to taunt Hannah. But what made it even worse was the stigma of the, of the society back then of a wife who couldn't bear a child for her husband. The wife was considered worthless, useless. It was shameful. Hannah had the pains of being barren, heightened by this rival wife taunting her. And I understand that having a second wife is a sin, but that's our not a topic for right now. It's another topic for another day. We'll get back to Hannah now and her pain. Because her pain even continued as she went to the temple of the Lord during their annual trip there. There as she went to the temple to pray to the Lord, to pour out her soul of all her troubles. She prayed to the Lord asking him for help, saying, O Lord of armies, if you will carefully consider the misery of your servant and remember me, and if you do not forget your servant, but give your servant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall ever touch his head. And while she was praying, she wasn't praying this just in her head, or even out loud as was the custom of the time. Instead, she was praying this silently while still moving her lips. The priest there, Eli, saw this and he right away jumped to the worst conclusion. He went over there to Hannah, who was just pouring out her soul, who was in deep trouble of her pain that she was going through. And Eli partially told her, How long are you going to be drunk? Get away from your wine! Hannah had the pain of being barren that was only heightened by this rival wife taunting her and the stigma of society back then of how she would be perceived. And then it was only made worse by a priest that saw her who falsely accused her of being drunk. Yes, Hannah had troubles in her life. And then she was given something to look forward to, even right there while she was with Eli, the priest. Hannah cleared up the situation with Eli, telling her that she wasn't drunk, she was just pouring out her soul to the Lord, asking for help. And Eli responded this time, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel give you what you ask for. Hannah left. She was intimate with her husband. She conceived and she gave birth to a male child and named him Samuel. 
she would have at least a little joy leaving the temple, having that blessing from the priest. Her joy increased as she learned that she was pregnant and she could eagerly wait for her child to be born. And she certainly would have joy when she gave birth to her to this child, found out that it was a male child just as she had asked. And she certainly enjoyed the time that she had raising this baby boy, Samuel, until the time that he was weaned. And then, the joy of her life, she simply gave back to the Lord. Are you confused by that? How Hannah could simply give her child, who was probably about the age of a kindergartner, back to the Lord. How she was willing to give her son to the Lord, her son that was such a great source of joy to her. And she did so voluntarily. Well, I can tell you how she gave up her son that she was waiting for to make her life better. Hannah could do so because well, as great as her son was, what was best is God's glory that was still to be revealed. And Hannah was eagerly awaiting for the glory of the Lord to be revealed. We see that in Hannah's prayer right after our text. Hannah begins her prayer, ends her prayer, waiting for God's glory to be revealed. Her prayer goes like this. My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is raised high. My mouth is opened wide against my enemies. Because I find joy in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. Yes, there is no one but you, and there is no rock like our God. And then she concludes, The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king. He will raise up the horn of his anointed one. She waited with eager expectation of God's glory to be revealed as Jesus, as the anointed one, would come here on earth. She also eagerly waited for when God's glory would be revealed, when the Lord would come to judge the ends of the earth. And so she was willing to give up her son, her joy, because her greatest joy and confidence did not come from her son, but it came from the Lord and awaiting his glory. You eagerly await for what is better in your lives. You look forward to what is better because your life is filled with well, pains, toils, and sorrows. And this full COVID-19 hasn't made your daily life any better. In fact, it has heightened these pains, toils, and sorrows that you have in your daily life that you try to forget about and to not even think about it as you look forward to what is better to come. In fact, COVID-19 has even created some pains for you. One of these created pains is that we are unable to meet together in person to worship our Lord right here in this church building. And because of that, we are unable to encourage each other as we give praise to our Lord. We are unable to encourage each other while we're worshiping Him just by, our, by seeing and hearing each other. Unable to encourage each other after the worship service as we talk with each other and, and share with each other the highs and the lows of our past week. Unable to encourage each other as we gather together for other special events that we host. Yeah. We have pains. This whole situation is just one big pain that we are unable to meet together in worship. What helps to get through 
these bad situations, such as not being able to worship together in person, is knowing and waiting for the day that we are able to gather together once again in person to worship our Lord. And I'm happy to announce that we are planning on worshiping together in person in this very building starting on June 6th. June 7th. I mean, the first Sunday of June. And there, we are able to encourage each other just by our presence and by our voices as we give praise to God. And I'm sure we'll be encouraging each other as we go outside and from a safe distance we are able to talk with one another and share each other's highs and lows from this past week and then to give further encouragement that we'll see each other again next week to worship our Lord. We will also have no longer just this up and down interaction with our worship between ourselves and God. We will once again have this sideways interaction with each other. And we will also be able to receive the Lord's Supper that we have fasted from for months now as we come and worship Him. As great as it will be to be able to worship together again um, in just a few weeks here at church, it's not quite the best. The best is yet to come. What is best for you is when God's glory will fully be revealed to you. God's glory is only revealed in part here on earth. You hear the recorded glory of God in His Word. You hear that your sins are forgiven from the mouth of God's called worker, from your pastor. You, re you receive and you taste, touch, and smell Christ's body and blood in with and under the bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. But when you go to heaven, God's glory will fully be revealed to you. It will no longer be in part, but you'll see it fully. There in heaven, you will hear the recorded glory of God, but instead you'll stand in the midst of God's glory and seeing it with your very own eyes. There in heaven, you won't hear the pardoning proclamation that your sins are forgiven from another's voice, but you hear it from Christ's own voice that he loves you and he has saved you. And there in heaven, you won't feel Christ's body in, with, and under the bread and wine, but you'll feel Christ's body in the flesh there in heaven. Now don't get me wrong, it is joyful to be able to worship our Lord together here on earth, but what is best is when we get to worship our Lord in perfect heaven, where God's full glory will be fully revealed to us. And so like Hannah, we are willing to give up the things that we wait for that are better for our earthly life, because we know what is best. Because our greatest joy and confidence is not on the things that we wait for that make our earthly lives better. But what is best is the Lord in awaiting His glory. What we wait for here on earth is better than the daily pains and toils and sorrows that we go through. But we'll have to wait for what is best. We'll have to wait until the end when on our last day we'll arrive to heaven where God's glory is fully revealed to us. That is what is best for all of us. Amen. At this time, we confess our faith together 
using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Right now, we typically continue worshiping our Lord with our offerings, and we can't do that right now in person, but you can still worship the Lord with your offerings by following the link in the description below, or for further details on other ways, you can check our Facebook page or our, website, our church's website. For now, we pray the prayer of the church. O Lord God, our strength, our song, and our salvation, you fulfilled your promises by the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. Thanks be to God. You give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In your compassion, you sent Christ, the Good Shepherd, who laid down his life to rescue the lost. Drive out all doubt and gloom, that we may delight in your glorious triumph. Lift our eyes heavenward to see him who lives to make intercession for the saints and grant us confidence in the greatness of his power. Keep before us the vision of your redeemed people, standing before your throne and singing the song of victory. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive wisdom and power and honor and glory and praise. Make us instruments of your peace as we bring the good news of hope and new life to those around us. Guide us in the use of all that you have entrusted to us, our time, our talents, and our treasures. Praise and Lord, live in us that we may live for you. Merciful Lord Jesus, grant healing to the sick and strengthen the faith of the suffering and the dying. Assure them of your abiding presence and comfort them with the hope of eternal life. And Lord, on this day, on Memorial Day this Monday, set aside to honor those who have died in the service of our great country, O God. We thank you for giving us such patriotic citizens and a country that chooses to remember them. Also, on Memorial Day, we thank you for the saints who have gone before us in your service and have reserved for us the rich heritage of your gospel. We remember the blessings you gave to them and to us through them. Praise to you, O Savior, in your eternal glory. And hear us, Lord, as you bring you our private petitions. Gracious Father, you have restored to us the joy of your salvation. With happy hearts, we come before you and say, Alleluia, thanks be to God. Amen. We join together in the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you, and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
the Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We conclude our service with the closing hymn, I Walk in Danger All the Way, hymn 431.
Looking forward to seeing you soon. May the Lord bless your week and bless your weekend on this Memorial Day weekend. See you next time.